<laughs> this M3 was crashed into a house. <laughs> and I've just bought it. Which was a huge risk in itself. Especially knowing how hard this thing got hit. But as you all know, with huge risks come even bigger rewards. Now maybe you like me and you took one look at this M3 and think it don't look that bad, bearing in mind it's been through a house. I mean from this angle, it just looks like front end damage. But there's some damage on this car which may make it unrepairable. You're probably wondering, how did an M3 end up in a house? Now we'll get to that story, but let me tell you about the car because I think we've got a bargain providing that issue can be fixed. This is a 2022 car, it's almost new. It's also only done 4,000 miles. It's still got all the plastic on the mat. It's a competition, more power. Is it more power? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know, it's better. <laughs> the engine looks all good. Straight six, twin turbo, 503 bhp. If you look at it from this side, it looks all right. It has 19 inch wheels on the front, 20 inch wheels on the back, and it's an X drive. Wow. And a car like this, similar spec, are going for over 61,000 pounds. I got this for way cheaper than that. It's red. <laughs> I'll say it's orange. Do you know oh. what it is? That's red. Red. Oh, that's red. Same as Ferrari, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no way. That's 100% red. <laughs> Red. I'd say that's orange. You it, say it's red, really? It's no wait. Where's the where's the code? Toronto red. Ah. AKA orange. Now they're the good points of the car. But when you buy something cheap, there's always gonna be bad points. Every single airbag has deployed. The rear screen is completely smashed. The front window's cracked. There's damage to this headlight and this headlight. This oil looked like it was in the car. There's damage to the bumper, the crash bar, the bonnet, and the front wing. And there's a minor dent in the rear quarter. Now I've never repaired anything this bad ever before. This is structural damage, and we still don't know if it is repairable. But I wouldn't have pulled the trigger on buying this car if I believed it wasn't possible. The problem is, we don't know the full extent of the damage yet, and the only way to find out is to inspect it further. So we need to get this car inside so we can start stripping it completely apart. But to get the car into neutral, I need to be able to start the car to put it into neutral. The car won't start, there's no oil in it, we don't know if the engine runs. And to get the car into neutral, you have to go underneath the car to pull down a lever on the gearbox. Now if you remember when we did the BMW M5, we had to do something similar. Get underneath the car, find the gearbox, and then on that is a lever here which you have to pull down and then zip tie to the prop shaft to keep it in neutral. But that's just pointless, because even if we can get it into neutral, this wheel will not move. It is completely wedged on this quarter. To get it onto the pickup truck, we had to drag it on with a winch. And to get it off, well that was a whole different story. Even though it is four-wheel drive, the front wheels were still able to roll freely. Even with the car being in park, it's just the rear wheels that were locked. Honestly, I don't know where to start with this car, but my first plan is to probably cut this arch out so we can get this wheel moving, then see if we can get it in neutral, then see if we can start the engine. That's the plan. Being that you don't like BMWs, or do you like this one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. As Hannah still isn't keen on BMWs, I was gonna let her do the cutting of the rear quarter. I thought I was going up here. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> this doesn't seem right, but here it goes. <laughs> let the cutting commence. There's absolutely no way that this rear quarter is repairable. It will definitely have to be replaced. So with that in mind, I didn't feel too bad at chopping it to pieces. So this outer panel, if there's damage on this normally, the insurance, they probably wouldn't write it off. All of this is replaceable. It's the stuff inside, which is the structure. And we're hoping that, well, it's, it's clearly here but it's whether it's twisted the whole car and that's what we're trying to find out. And as I peel back the quarter, you can see the inner structure of the car now. Yeah, oh. that is not good. That is not good at all, is it? 
Again, we're not really going to find out whether the chassis is twisted or not until we can get it inside and measured up. Wait until you guys see how I think it's crashed into a house. And you all need to see it as well. It is bizarre. It is bizarre. Oh, don't break it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's an ECU there as well. That's just shopping. Look at the boot floor. Oh, my God. Next step. See if we can get it in neutral. Step after that, get it in. Step after that, get it started. I think it'll start. What, have you even all that oil on the floor? I reckon we'll be able to drive it then. It'll start, but not for very long. <laughs> oh yeah, do you think we could drive it? Not what? with a suspension like that, no. Why don't it just why jump it around? It might go. It'll just crab, wouldn't it? Why don't you just start it here, then you can put it into neutral manually. Oh yeah, and then get it in drive. Well, I could just drive it if we could start it here. Yeah. There's no reason why this won't drive apart from all the oil on the floor. Has it got oil in it? You can't test it with oh, the you... carbine. Oh, yeah. Now the wheel has clearance to turn, but instead of going underneath the car to try and get it in neutral to push it, we decided it's a better option to try and start it and actually drive it. Problem is, we can't check the oil on this engine. We can't check the oil because there's no dipstick for checking the oil because for some reason, they decide not to make cars with dipsticks anymore. It's something to do with emissions, that, isn't it? Weight saving. <laughs> so, I don't think there's gonna be any oil in it and BMWs insist for some reason, Matt, check this out, underneath here, see at the very bottom, down there, yeah, that's the oil cooler. BMW put them on the very bottom of the car, which makes sense it's gonna get mad aero, but also if you hit a speed bump or whatever, it's it's just gonna perish your oil cooler. So my plan is to go underneath and find the oil cooler feed pipe and the return pipe. I'm gonna unbolt both of them from the oil cooler. Does any oil come out? <laughs> oh, no. oh. Ah. And then find some kind of hose to bridge the gap between the two. Oh, oh there, there is. is, there is, there is. Okay, okay, there's oil, there's oil in this one. This is gonna do it. This is gonna be our oil cooler. Now, instead of the oil circulating through an oil cooler, it will just pass through my silicon hose, which is good enough to get the car started and into the unit. The metal part of the hoses are kinked, so I'm gonna have to replace them anyway. So I've cut them off, so now we can slide on my silicon hose. Here it is. Da -da -da. Whoa! So the only way now of finding out how much oil is in it is drain it all out of the engine, but then it's just going to be carnage. I, I think the best plan is to get power to the battery, put the, get the dash lit up, and the dash will probably say if it's got no oil in it straight away, surely. If you've watched any of my videos before, then you'd know that usually when the car has a crash, it blows the pyro fuse when the airbags blow, which stops the power going to the starter motor. You'll still get power in the car, but you won't get power to the starter motor. This is the first time I've actually seen a pyro fuse here on the actual battery terminal. So what this is doing is stopping the power going along here, down into this cable, and then this cable is sending the power directly down to the starter motor. So now I'm gonna see if I can break open the casing of the pyro fuse to see if there's any way of bridging the gap so the power will get sent to the starter motor. And I've never seen this type of pyro fuse before. So the pyro fuse, all that does, when it blows, it literally pops off like that and that's why that's a little bit bent. But by doing that, we've got direct power to the motor starter motor now. Look at that, it's in, it's in, it's fixed. So by doing that now, I've bridged the gap in the pyro fuse and I could put it back to the positive on the battery terminal. It's almost like BMW knew people were gonna crash them. Right, we got power. Add coolant, it says, so we got no coolant. Does it say add oil? Oh, I've got half a tank of fuel. It also says we have 7,000 miles on the clock, not 4,000. But this all adds to the story later on in the video. Now, my dad's gonna add some oil into the engine because we're still unsure of how much it actually has in. And having it a little overfilled is better than having none in at all at this moment. The reason the bonnet is like this is, can you see that, Matt? Then th that thing there is a pedestrian protection system. When you hit something on the front, and it hits this pipe here, what will happen is your hinge 
will blow up from the back because if you've hit a pedestrian, it will stop them from hitting the head on the engine. That's right. If you do hit something from the front, the hinge pop up at the back, cushioning the blow for potentially a pedestrian. And the only way to fix this now is to replace the hinges and the explosive device which pops them off. There you go. Well, the more you know, hey? <laughs> <laughs> if, it's not, if it starts rattling, turn it off instantly. Or if we just go no. I'll just wait for the no. There's two big moments here. One, whether it starts, which I think it should. And two, whether the gearbox is okay. Fingers are crossed. The last thing we need is something wrong with the engine or the gearbox. That would throw us back massively. Ready? Here it yeah. goes. Smooth as anything. Sounds mint. It ran. <laughs> that was easy. And it was running good. Any oil coming out? A bit of water dripping. Any lights on the dash? A few lights on the dash. What? Oh, sounds cool. Oh, that's it. Oh, restraint system. Oh, that sounds good. Let's see if it'll drive. Go and drive. See if it'll go and drive. Yeah, that's drive. That's drive. Now, will it actually move with its own power? It's moving. Is it moving? Go on. Go on. It's moving. <laughs> and it did. Just about. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my! Yeah. It's the little wins that matter. It's good. Even, the, even the lights work. Indicate left. Yeah! <laughs> it's all right. Okay, cool it off. But at least now we know the engine seems good and the gearbox. We got that car running pretty fast, and as you all know, I'm far from a mechanic. But the experience I've had from the previous cars that we've rebuilt and learnt from has made jobs like this much quicker and easier. Guess it's the experience that does really matter. Now it's time to see if this thing's actually repairable. A lot of people might think that this whole chassis would have been twisted. Now, the reason why I bought this is because I don't think it is twisted. But if it's hit here, and if anything had moved, you'd see it in the roof. Now the roof's carbon fiber, and it's not broken. There's no kinks here, but if we come over this way, if it had bananaed the car, you'd see some form of dent or movement along here. There's no movement here. All the lines on this side look absolutely perfect. The boot looks like it has gone that way, but, we found a reason for that is because all the hinge up here has all been hit. The only thing I couldn't see when I bought the car is the subframe underneath. And if the subframe has twisted or moved, we could be in for an, an issue, which means it may need to go on a jig, depending on how bad it is. But we haven't seen underneath the car yet. So first step, get it in the air and we'll have a look at the damage underneath. Now, one thing you might be surprised to see is that on the car vertical report, the car actually comes back all clean. No mileage fraud, no records of theft, and no records of damage. And I think there's a reason for this, which we'll find out later. Front looks all right. For now, actually looking underneath the car for the first time, the front doesn't look too bad. Anything that's broken or bent so far looks like it just unbolts and could be replaced. Okay. The big part. Now we're going to check whether the subframe has moved. I can see where it bolts up here, and it looks all right. It's bent this arm, isn't it? This one. Ah, yeah. Ah, that's bent. Ah, yeah, there it is. I can now see why the back left wheel has moved, because this rear trailing arm is definitely bent. But looking at where the subframe bolts up to the chassis, there's no evidence so far that there's any movement there, which is great. Here's a rear trailing arm on the right-hand side of the car, and the rear trailing arm on the left. I can 100% confirm that's definitely Ben. And now we're bringing out the tram gauge. We're gonna be measuring from corner to corner of the subframe to see if we get the same measurement. And if we do, we know that the subframe's sitting in the right place. I'm in the middle. Good news. Good, so it is literally straight. So that is the best way to find out if something's straight. And that is bang on, we're not out like, you probably get a few mil tolerance, but we're going directly to the center of each side of the bolt. That's good. If it was bent, then it would have moved something, but 
That is bang on. And that is called a tram gauge. And that's what the professionals use in. We use the professionals. I'm just going to undo this arm here. Let's see. see if you can push it back. And see if it moves the wheel a bit. The wheel's oh, moving. I felt a lot of yeah, release it's, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's moving already. The wheel's moving, for sure. Now I'm going to take that rear arm off. Now if the wheel moves back in the correct place, it may just be as simple as one bent arm on the rear. <gasps> rear wheel steer. <laughs> Look at that, it's straight. <laughs> I can't believe how much it moves. Look at that. <laughs> it's not rear wheel steer. <laughs> Did you say that you think we should replace it all anyway? I feel like we I feel like we should. You don't know what's bent and what isn't bent by just looking at it. Good news, monumental moment. We think this car could be repaired, but we need to now see how much damage is behind that quarter. But how exactly did this car end up like this in the first place? Well, I found this listing before the car was crashed for sale at this place online. And this was the place I actually picked up the crashed car from. You can see the car looks pretty good here and it's only done 4,500 miles. But it must have drove around two and a half thousand miles more and then end up in a house. But my first question is, how did someone even manage to drive it in the house? I still cannot get my head around it and I don't think the police could either. Here's the house, car entered here. Yeah. How is the car Entered the house there. The house that it hit is on the corner of the road here. If the car was driving down this way, it's too much of an angle for it to hit the rear quarter on the wall there and then go into the house. So my only thought is that the car was coming down from this angle down here and maybe spun somehow, hit the rear quarter into the wall and then go into the house. Excuse me, teacher. Yeah. Do you know on the previous photograph, have yeah. we got any tyre marks on this grass? Oh. None, none at all. There's no tyre marks on the floor and none of the grass between the road and the house has even been picked up. So how has it ended up in the house? I guess we won't know and we might not ever know, but one thing is for sure that I do know <sighs> is that the person who drove it into the house was either not insured or didn't go for insurance. So let me show you why. On the car vertical check, as I mentioned, it shows completely clean, no record of damage. So they never went through the insurance and that's why it never got registered. And to be honest, I think if it did go through insurance, it might have just been a complete write off, never to be put back on the road. But I guess again, we'll never know. But if the car was recorded as damaged, then it would show up on a car vertical check. Just like this BMW 3 Series here. Not only has it been in an accident, I can also see it's got outstanding finance on it. And on top of that, because the car was auctioned off at a car crash auction website, I can see the photos of the actual damage, which does come in handy if you are thinking about buying a crash damaged car or buying a car that you never thought was in an accident. So if you've never checked your car out before, go and do it with the link in the description box below because this month, using my discount code MATT, there's a 20% offer off to get you 20% off your car vertical check. Go check it out now. That is serious. Oh my God, it's eaten the arch lining. Look at that. That's the arch lining. This, so the whole car is built in sections and this is all steel, so unlike the M5 where it was aluminium and it was all bonded and riveted, this is just spot welded all together. We think, we think. We th We've got to strip more of this car apart to see how far the damage has got. Which means taking apart everything on the rear end. First thing off, the rear bumper. Bit by bit, we're getting there. Everything in the back left is in a pretty bad way and we're definitely gonna have to replace it. That's if we decide it's repairable. Underneath all this sealer is where all the panels are joined together. So every time we see a bit of seal, it's covering over the spot welds. We've now got to work out how many panels actually need replacing. And with the next step being taken out the arch lining, we found the damage is a lot worse than we thought. Force. Reusing that bit then. <laughs> Look at this. 
Look at the window wheel off. Even my dad looks shocked at this one. <laughs> The whole back end, inner arch lining, and it looks like the boot floor has all been damaged. Now I'm stripping apart the inside of the boot, taking off the wiring and all the amplifiers, which leaves us with this. I don't know if this is right, but I'm gonna cut it. <laughs> We're gonna see. I'm gonna go just, I'm just gonna go. <laughs> Oh. oh my god. How's it worse? What does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. Oh my. It is bad, isn't it? That's well bad. Now what? We've still got to continue stripping it because the damage just keeps on going. And I don't want to buy anything for this car if it's just completely scrap. So the next thing to take off is the parcel shelf. We want to see if that's got any damage from the rear quarter being hit in so far. First off, we can get the fabric off it. Then there's a bunch of sound deadening, which we can work at getting off now. Along that are the seat belts and a couple of trim clips. And as we thought, the parcel shelf is also kinked. So that's either gonna have to be pulled straight or just straight up replaced. Next up is removing the back seat and the rear bench to see if there's somehow any damage there, because if there is, I definitely think that this car is long gone. But it's looking all good. So now we're moving back on to the boot. We can see that the boot lid has moved over because on the parcel shelf where it holds the hinge, it is completely bent. You can see my dad struggling to get the ratchet on the nut here. I've then got to remove the spring from the boot lid on both sides. Springs out. And then also the hydraulic strut which holds the boot up. After that, me and my dad can remove it. So this is what we're initially left with. There is a lot of damage here, but the good news, the good news, looking at the positives, is that the rail on the back looks completely untouched. Obviously, I'm gonna have to measure up everything to make sure it is straight, but I'm pretty confident to say that this is completely straight along with that one, and most of the damage is caused all on the inside here. The inner wheel arch is gone, and even the parcel shelf on here is all kinked and moved. You can see this bit is just lifted up, which is why the boot has moved over. I think this is repairable, but it is nothing I've ever repaired before. So with the car as is, with the damage at the back, all the airbags deployed, the damage at the front, damage to both headlights, and bearing in mind it's only done 7,000 miles and it's not registered as crashed. I got this car for two months. 32,000 pounds. I don't think it's cheap, but I don't think it's too expensive if all of this can be repaired. Bearing in mind that if we repair this car, it'll be completely clean title. So you're looking at over 62,000 pounds for the spec that it is. But as I mentioned, before I spend any money on this car, I think I want a professional to look over it to make sure it is actually safe to repair. This is going to be one hell of a journey. If you enjoyed the video, hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up button, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out. Oh, good boy. So good boy. No! <laughs> it's oh, fell off. It's fell off. <laughs> no, it's not bad. Oh, no. <laughs> so in very bad. Like a drug I just can't deny.